The game has changed. I mean, it used to be a movie was valuable if it had a big showing at the box office, though there was the occasional film that did, did big rental business but didn't do much in theaters. For more on that, see the entire careers of the Olsen twins after Full House. And then for TV, much of the same. A show is big if it gets people to watch commercials or buy cable. Well, the game has changed. Welcome to Fort Knox. I'm John Fort from CNBC. Streaming is shaping, shaking things up. Netflix has a Best Picture nominee in Roma. Netflix and Amazon had big showings at the Golden Globes. As the streaming wars keep getting hotter, it's worth asking the question, what really makes a show or a movie valuable? What's more valuable, a movie like Bird Box or a show like you? Joining me today to discuss, Andrew Yateman is a former Netflix executive, current head of the Americas for Moonbug Entertainment. Later, we're going to have CNBC's Julia Borston, Forbes' is Scott Mendelson is going to join me. Last but not least, Yuri Singer, movie producer and CEO of Tailflick. But first, Andrew, I want to talk to you about what you do and the insight that gives you into what's really valuable for these streaming services. I mean, Moonbug is, is looking at gathering a bunch of safe and fun content for kids. Why is that necessary in the, in the streaming era? So, so thanks, John. First of all, it's great to be here. So that's right. So Moonbug is a new company. We are acquiring uh, kids' content that has big, passionate audiences on digital platforms today, such as YouTube, all over the world, and then we're investing in them to grow them and to take them to, to more and more audiences, to improve the content, take them all over the world. And the reason why we're doing this is because, frankly, because kids' viewing habits have changed completely. I mean, today, YouTube is the number one brand among kids. Netflix is not far behind. Three quarters uh, of kids watch YouTube on a daily, on a regular basis. And, um, and so it's really big audiences, and it's audiences that are very passionate about it. And so that's why, we're, that's why we're focused on this space, because it's where the audiences are, and it's the next generation, and they're just growing up with this stuff that, that the so, streaming services is what they're living with. So, Andrew, what's the most valuable type of kids' content to a service like a Netflix or uh, an Amazon Prime Video, and why? What is it about it? Is it uh, the way people keep coming back to watch, drawing in a new audience? How does it pencil out? Yeah, so kids' content does, does a lot of things for these services. Uh, what, exactly. Kids like to re-watch their favorite content. They like to come back and watch it. And so uh, that's exactly one of the things that makes it so valuable. It provides kind of stickiness for these services. So as a parent, you might want, you might, be watching a show and then it ends and then you might not watch another show for a few weeks but your kids are probably watching on a regular basis and that's the kind of content that we that we're creating and distributing and bringing to so audiences. So that keeps the parent from dropping the service. I mean, is that what it comes down to? Lower yeah, churn. I mean, it, it, higher loyalty. If if my kid stays quiet on the plane watching that thing, I am sure going to keep paying that service every month. If my kid is getting value from it, the service, then I'm getting value from the service. And so, therefore, yeah, exactly, it helps stickiness. That's right. So, um, with Moonbug itself, is that just a new version of the sort of content specialist that's all, always existed in Hollywood? Or, you know, or is, it, is it something entirely new? So it, it, we're basically seeing it's a new source of IP, right? We're finding this grassroots content that is being produced all over the world and then watched all over the world, and that's only possible because of streaming services like YouTube and the democratization of producing content, and, and we're bringing them to the rest of the world. So I'll give you an example. The first, the first property that we acquired is a, is a nursery rhyme channel for toddlers called Little Baby Bum. And if you don't have kids under the age of five, you've probably never heard of it. But if, you're on, if you do have kids under the age of five, most likely you have, because nearly half of kids under five in the U.S. watch Little Baby Bum on a regular basis. Hmm. And in countries like the U.K., it's actually over that. It's two-thirds of now, kids. So. Little Baby Bum, I take it that's the like, British bum, like small baby butt, as opposed to that, little... That, Baby. That is exactly right, right it, and okay, it actually right, does right. come from the UK originally, <laughs> right, but it's okay. being watched all over the world. There's even audiences in, you know, we recently found out North Korea who are watching it. So um, North so Korea? It, it, all over the world, including there. Huh, broadband in North Korea. That's, um, that's news in and of itself. So, <laughs> so explain to me, you were at Netflix, explain to me um, Bird Box. Saw it over the weekend. Um, Sandra Bullock, one of the most amazing things to me about Bird Box is Sandra Bullock 
is 10 years older uh, than than Sarah Paulson, but is playing her younger sister and manages to pull it off. But what is it about this movie that makes it valuable for Netflix? What is it about this movie that makes it valuable for Sandra Bullock? Could this movie have actually been released in theaters, or is it a unique product of the digital streaming era we're in? Um, so obviously I had nothing to do with, with the movie itself, yeah, and I won't yeah, comment you, on the creative, but absolutely, the, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. absolutely, you know, so Netflix is putting out movies that absolutely could be, could be seen in theaters and could have done well in theaters. And you asked a question earlier about what kind of defines a hit today when you can't just compare ratings on different channels or box office from different movies. One way that I think of a hit in the world of streaming with personalization is if everybody in your circle, in your social circle, so your social media, your friends and family, word of mouth is talking about something, then you know it's a hit and you don't have to have the numbers. And that certainly was the case for Bird Box over, over the holidays, and that certainly drummed up a whole lot of word of mouth for Netflix. And if everyone's talking about it and you don't have Netflix, uh, you will probably might want to sign up to Netflix to watch Bird Box to see what everyone's talking about. So is that, is that how Netflix is going to pencil this one out and how much it was worth? Because, I mean, I, I take it Sandra Bullock, not cheap. I mean, she's a star. She executive produced this. She stars in it. She, uh, I guess, gets to write it in a way that used to be reserved for male actors, by the way. I love that about this. It used to be if you were a male actor over 50, you got to have the younger love interest and, you know, play the, the, the dad of, of young kids, even though it was biologically questionable. Hey, but now she's doing it. Um, what, what's the value of it to talent like Sandra Bullock that took a chance, I guess, in going with Netflix? And then what's the value to Netflix in having this kind of a buzzy hit that I, I guess maybe they could have predicted? I mean, I think from a talent perspective, you, you've gotten, as you said, you've gotten to have kind of more creative input into in the, the content you're, you're starring in. And then you have a huge audience all over the world watching it. So that's really valuable. And, you know, for Netflix, there's lots of different metrics that they look at, obviously, the size of the audience. But, yeah, word of mouth and people talking about it is absolutely something that drives value for these services as they try to keep their existing subscribers and try to get new subscribers. Now, what's your take on this show, You? used to be on Lifetime, didn't see many people were watching it, then Netflix picks it up, and at least I'm told it's a big buzzy hit now. I don't know how that's measured um, since Netflix doesn't put out numbers, I guess, by social media and the followers that people are getting. Is that because Lifetime has kind of grown this reputation as belonging to a certain demographic of people who stay at home and watch melodramas, and so you know, it couldn't break out there, but on Netflix, it's hip and cool, and so the audience is willing to see it. I mean, how, how does that happen? Well, it, you're right that, that a lot of kind of traditional or linear networks tend to appeal to specific demographics, and Netflix has been able to appeal to broad, wide demographics, pretty much anybody. And so uh, even though a show or a movie might not be a great fit for a specific network, potentially, um, you know, Netflix might be able to find a whole different audience, and they also don't have to necessarily make decisions based on, you know, Live Plus 7, Live Plus 3 ratings. They can look at the audience over a larger period of time, so it gives them a little more, uh, you know, a, a little more ability to give a show or a movie a little bit of, of more rope in order to find the audience. Finally, awards. Uh, we just got the Academy Award nominees out, and Roma is big on the nominee list. That caught my eye because this is one of the films that Netflix pulled from Cannes uh, in, in 2018 over this controversy on how they were presented. That has to be kind of industry shaking in the sense that Cannes doesn't want to lose a, a film like this in the future. If it's going to even rack up this many nominations, does it change the very culture of film around the world? So what, one of the last areas in the movie and TV world that the streaming services had not really um, had much of an impact yet is, is the award movies, Academy Award movies. So I do think this is a big milestone year with Netflix. You know, first of all, yesterday joining the Motion Picture Association of America alongside the major studios, and then also really making a splash in terms of so many Oscar nominations for Romas. You kind of don't get more mainstream and traditional entertainment than the Academy Awards, so it, it is a milestone, a milestone week, I guess, and this is going to be a milestone year for the 
streaming in general. I think it's going to be the biggest year for the streaming industry um, that there has been yet because while Netflix is joining the party for the Academy Awards, you also have the you know Disney, Warner Media, part of AT and T, mm -hmm. Apple, all launching their streaming services later this year, and then you also have Quibi, the the service from Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman, launching later this year as well. So. The, the industry is, is changing very rapidly, and we're far from kind of mature and settled of how this is all going to play out. Yeah, uh, we'll see how many of those can actually survive and be viable businesses. So you've given insight into what makes the content valuable. Andrew Yateman uh, from Moonbug Entertainment. Thanks for being Thanks, with John. us. Thanks, John. Great uh, to be here. This is Fort Knox. We are talking about what makes this content really valuable in a streaming era. I mean, how valuable is an Oscar nomination versus just really strong social media buzz. Joining us now to take us deeper on the producer's perspective, Yuri Singer, CEO of Tail Flick, founder and CEO of Passage Pictures. His latest film, Marjorie Prime, starred John Hamm and Tim Robbins. He's also working with Ethan Hawke on uh, Nikola Tesla uh, biopic. Um, thanks for being with us, Yuri. I I'm wondering your, your reaction you to this latest slate of nominees and winners in award season and and what impact these streaming players continue to have over the creative process and what what's deemed really valuable in hollywood so i think uh roma yesterday really opened um, opened the door if you would think five years ago if uh, somebody would say that uh, uh, the streaming services are going to be nominated for 10 Oscars, the most nominated movie <laughs> of, of the year. Nobody would believe it. So I think uh, we're in a new reality. Uh, as a producer, it gives us another um, window of opportunity of getting directors to understand. Uh, for me personally, when I offered the, the director of Marjorie Prime, as you mentioned, to do a movie with Netflix, uh, a short time ago, uh, he thought, no, streaming is not good. Today, people and great directors are open because they get bigger budgets and it's possible to make uh, more quality uh, productions. Well, take me a little deeper into this Roma story because Alfonso Coron uh, produced, co edited it, uh, directed it, a known quantity in Hollywood for sure. And, and so it, it's not like this is something that Netflix found at the bottom of some you know, bargain bin heap. What's the significance of the decision he made to go with them, sort of the, the, the can controversy from 2018 uh, and how Netflix pulled out of that and how all of that's likely to play in the future? I mean, is, are these nominations bigger from an audience perspective or from a Hollywood talent perspective saying, hey, here's a distribution method that you can really count on as, as a number one top tier distributor? I think you're absolutely on the nose, the latter. I think uh, definitely talent uh, that was reluctant to put their name into uh, TV shows and, and movies in the streaming uh, services today got the answer. I mean, Roma is, is allowing the director to do whatever he wants uh, with the budget he wants and go wild. And that risk taking uh, studios uh, are um, not that keen on doing. Uh, when I had a, um, I, I found move books uh, that I tried to turn into uh, into um, uh, movies. Uh, I, I optioned a book called The Zero um, by Jess Walter, and I had Ethan Hawke attached and, and a great director, Jose Pagilia. I went to the streaming services because they see the potential. They can do a controversial movie. Uh, without a bigger risk that the studios have, um, the regular studios have. So I think today talent and directors uh, are much more respectful of the possibilities that the streaming allow them. Uh, they go, they pitch themselves. Yeah. If you see Amazon Studios and Netflix, uh, the line of, of uh, stars that are coming to pitch their projects and uh, uh, is is unheard of. So you're, like, yeah, uh, give me your take. Give me your take on Bird Box. I was just talking about this with Andrew. Just watched it over the weekend. Yeah, I know it took a while, uh, but but a few things struck me about it. Would that have played with a major studio in the pre-streaming area uh, era? A 54-year-old actress, Sandra Bullock, hasn't had a huge hit in a while that I can recall, at least on uh, the silver screen. Says I'm going to play the mom of a toddler and have a younger love interest 
and be in this kind of action flick situation and there's no superheroes and you know none of that would that have gotten picked up or is this something that could only happen in the era of over the top and streaming so I, I think that it would have actually uh, being a studio movie and a success uh, there is a, a the quiet place a movie with my partner John Krasinski is yeah. doing a movie with me with Matt Damon uh, at Universal has done and I think that opened the door to that kind of of uh, of success I think that without uh, John's uh, Krasinski success with quiet place uh, Sandra Bullock would not have been would not have gotten that uh, big of an audience uh, and eyeballs so I don't think necessarily uh, it's a success for streaming I think it's a success based on the previous success which is Hollywood uh, known for um, I think that uh, the same as what Netflix and the streaming services are now looking at they're looking for original content and uh, I'll, I'll give you a short plug-in but I, I opened a company <laughs> called Tailflix a tail flick with uh, ex Netflix and Apple employee, uh, a brilliant uh, partner um, of mine, George Berry, and we made a platform in order to allow authors from around the world to be able to present their content. So we're looking right. for uh, for stories, good stories, because all those streamings, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and now with Disney, they're looking for great content. The streaming How do you tell, success. Though? How do you tell mm -hmm. what makes a good story a, a good TV show or a good movie? Like, is there an algorithm that they're running through? I mean, the, the secret sauce in Netflix is supposed to be the data they've got, who their customers are, what they like to watch. Are, are they really adhering to that data or are they using their gut in, in the old school sense? What's really happening? So the streaming, especially Netflix, are definitely data driven. I mean, they look what what uh, even uh, according to what you're searching. And if you have if you're searching for something and a family member is searching in the same house, they know to have the cover of the of the, the, the movie different for you based on your searches. So they definitely know what you're searching and uh, they, they choose by the data. However, the whole industry is more of if the book is a bestseller, doesn't have to be a good story. If the book is a bestseller or has a large social uh, following, that will interest them. And again, I'll, I'll go back to The King of Oil. That's a book that I optioned, uh, and I brought it to the major studios and the streaming, and they said, is it a bestseller? And I said, no, but the story is great. And after Matt Damon was interested, everybody was interested. But it's very hard for me as a producer to find that content and that's where we uh, we came up with the solution of finding great stories not necessarily bestsellers huh. but great stories that that uh, are around the world are you specifically not looking for bestsellers because i imagine i mean you guys are, are are kind of money ball right i mean you, you're looking for uh, the diamond in the rough or or maybe not the diamond for for the ruby or the sapphire maybe the the less popular gem that you can polish up and and maybe get some margin on is that how that works we're looking for the needle in the haystack, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're looking for a lot of needles. But I, but I, I, uh, we, the problem is that the bestsellers, the top 200 books, uh, are going direct to the studios, so they have access. But right. all the other 99% in the world do not have access, and we're looking for what makes a good story and what it can become. Uh, what what the studios and the streaming services are interested and it's not necessarily the same so we have the insight of what they're looking and we have the content uh, piling in and we source it and curate it with an algorithm first but then if the story is good we have our human uh, super readers that hmm. decide if that is good for human uh, adaptation super readers. And, uh, what's yes. a, what's a human super reader a human super meter is uh, the third tier of readers of our platform that uh, when the book is actually chosen and is good, the story behind it is good, it has a niche, it has an arc, and uh, the super reader is a script writer that is uh, worked in the industry, knows what the studios need, knows what can be good on screen or not, hmm. and can detect the needle from the haystack. I see. So um, people still playing a role despite the data out there. It, it seems like we're kind of establishing that uh, the award season is big for the Hollywood establishment, for, for the streaming services being able to prove to the talent 
that they are a top tier distributor, it's worth doing a deal with us. Really the popularity and buzz, that's what gets the audience, you know, social media, et cetera, to, to kind of tune in and, and keep from churning off of these platforms. What's the role, if any, of the star? You mentioned Matt Damon. Uh, it seemed like the, the story that you were trying to get out there wasn't getting picked up at first because it wasn't a be uh, bestseller, but once Matt Damon was attached to it, people got interested. I, I thought the era of the megastar was over. They still have pull? It, they, it, they, not over on the country. They are much more in demand huh. uh, because there is so much more content being developed and produced and the stars that actually count, which greenlight the movie or that have a long, large following, they are in the, they get so many good scripts now. They get so many good projects, and they have to choose what they want. And if they choose one kind of movie, they they, they have they are really uh, the decision makers, like a streaming ah. service. Um, the streaming service can some of them, and I can't mention names, but they will look <laughs> what are the names are. They sometimes won't even read the script and they will approve a movie just based on the names uh, attached. So, so we've heard that on the big screen, the years are past where people would go and pay to see a movie in the theater just based on Tom Hanks or Will Smith being attached to it. But maybe in streaming, where people are already paying monthly, they're going to watch it and maybe not churn if they can see Sandra Bullock or if they can see Tom Hanks or if they can see you know, a name, an actor they know. Exactly. Exactly. If you see, mm. if you see their success, uh, their success is based on there is really a, a direct correlation between the name of the star, the name of the actor, the name of the talent, the name of the director as well in, in the Roma case, uh, which is a unique, uh, a unique success. It's a mega. It's 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 a masterpiece that doesn't matter where he would do it. Um, uh, it it would be a success. It's a brilliant. Yeah. Uh, uh, a piece of our time, so I take it aside. Now but if you look I on see. all the rest of the movies, it really depends on, on, on the megastar. And that's how we producers, when we have a great script, which is the first thing, and a great right. uh, filmmaker, we have to go and try to convince the actor why he should do our movie and not others, because he has so many uh, possibilities now. And now I see why the actors love this streaming era so much. Yuri Singer, CEO of Tailflick. Uh, thanks for joining me and for all that great insight. Once again, this is Fort Knox. We are talking about what really makes content valuable. Movies, TV shows, all of that, just stories in the streaming era. Joining us now to continue the conversation, CNBC's own Julia Borston and Forbes senior contributor Scott Mendelson. Julia, you're always at the Oscars. Um, you know, full disclosure, your husband is a big-time producer, so you guys have it covered from both sides, the making and the reporting. What was your take on Roma's big haul of nominations? Well, I think one thing's for sure. Netflix is no longer an outsider. Netflix is now officially part of the establishment. I think it's no coincidence that Netflix's Roma, the first time Netflix has ever been nominated for Best Picture, was it got those accolades on Tuesday, which is the very same day that Netflix joined the MPAA. That's <laughs> Hollywood's lobbying association. So pretty meaningful that Netflix is no longer part of the Internet Association. It's now part of Hollywood's lobbying association, the MPAA. And you have Netflix with this black and white film that's, that's all in Spanish having this film get nominated for Best Picture. It shows different content creators throughout Hollywood that Netflix can earn that top honor. It has a real shot if they come over, if, if Netflix can lure over more content creators by promising them a real shot at getting that kind of traditional Hollywood acclaim. And it shows they're just part of the establishment now. Well, pull out the crystal ball because Cuaron was well known before this. But what would have happened to this film had he not gone with Netflix, and he went with Netflix, you know, before Can, it had already been kind of committed to, picked up, et cetera. There was controversy about this at Can. What would have happened to this, and what happens at Can next year with Netflix, given the fact that I, I believe they passed up basically on having this because of their anti-Netflix rule? 
Well, there was a lot of question about how Netflix was going to release this. And in order to qualify this film, Roma, for the Oscars, it had to put it in theaters. So we don't know how much money this film actually generated at the box office because Netflix did this release in a very unusual way where they basically rented out theaters and then sold tickets from there and didn't have to actually disclose how many tickets were sold. But Netflix made it clear to the director, um, to the filmmaker, that they were going to distribute this in such a way that it would qualify for an Oscar. I think it's interesting that Netflix didn't tell us how many people have streamed Roma on the platform. <laughs> Bird Box is being a big hit. They've had a bunch of other TV shows drawing 40, 80 million households watching in their first four weeks. But it doesn't really matter to Netflix if Roma is a big hit on the platform all they need is to use this as a big hit with the Hollywood establishment to show them that they will do what it takes to give a film like Roma the attention it needs, both in theaters and at the Oscars. Scott Mendelson, um, th this award season is proving to be quite an eye opener. We're just talking about uh, Roma. It's not the only one if you look at Golden Globes as well. And then there's just the buzz around shows like you, uh, just just for one. Uh, What's your take on what's the most surprising thing that's happening and what really makes content valuable in the streaming era? Well, in the streaming era, to be sim you know, simply put, content is valuable if it makes the subscriber want to sign up for your service. Sign um, up or stay? Well, si initially sign up. Okay. And with the hopes that either they'll want to stay or they don't feel like expending the time and energy to cancel. Um, <laughs> Obviously, it's a little bit easier online than it is trying to cancel a cable company. Um, with something like Roma or Bird Box or Net, uh, You, which was a, a used to be a lifetime television show, it's as much about you know creating a, me a media narrative that this content matters to the pop culture zeitgeist. That matters as much, if not more so, than whether people actually watch it or not. So for something like Bird Box, which is a good, solid, three-star post-apocalyptic thriller <laughs> in a, with a major movie star in the form of Sandra Bullock, uh -huh. who still is a major movie star. Um, yes, I'm sure millions and millions of people watched that film over the first week. But just as importantly, through the online memes and media coverage of those online memes, Netflix was once again able to dominate the media even while audiences were flocking over the Christmas season to Aquaman and Mary Poppins and what have you. So it's, so yes, Scott, it's in, do, do you think that uh, Netflix, and there's a bit of speculation here, but you, you understand the, the industry. So with that, you know, kind of couching it, uh, speculate for me. Was this something that Netflix probably paid a lot of money for, uh, talking specifically about Bird Box? And so is the value of that influenced by how much they paid versus something like you, which didn't work on Lifetime. Maybe they got a deal on that and kind of turned that into a hit. What kind of situation is more valuable for a Netflix? Well, in terms of pure well, money, it's more valuable for them to spend less for equal or greater media coverage. Um, but for something like Roma or Bird Box, the goal with that, even aside from the Oscars, is using these limited theatrical releases as a carrot, as a way to entice bigger and bigger and more prestigious filmmakers. Come make a Netflix movie. Yeah. It will be in theaters. You'll get to make the kind of movie that Hollywood doesn't necessarily distribute anymore. And it won't just be on streaming. Yes, the vast majority of people will see Bird Box on Netflix or Roma on Netflix or Martin Scorsese's yeah. The Irishman on Netflix, but you'll still get the prestige of a glorified theatrical release. Yeah, Julia, get in there. And yeah, I just think the key thing here, John, is that Netflix is paying a lot of money for this content. They have to pay a lot of money to get an actress like Sandra Bullock to agree to do something like this. And they probably have to reassure her that they are going to be spending a lot of money on advertising and really promoting this. I mean, Netflix has huge power that they could put this bird box. They could autoplay the trailer every time I and the 150 million plus other Netflix subscribers around the world open up Netflix. So they're making a commitment not just in terms of the cost of the film itself, but also in terms of marketing, both to their own you know, existing audience, but also to audiences around the world. I think it's really interesting that Netflix has bought an outdoor advertising company. They own a billboard company, and this is <laughs> crucial because they want to make sure that their films are part of the conversation and have their, their billboards everywhere.
Wow. Yeah, it's, it's not quickster, but it's definitely old school. Last thing I want to get your take on before we go, comedy, stand-up on Netflix, um, pretty big category. What's their play? Julia, is it getting a group of people that, for whatever reason, wasn't watching HBO's comedy specials? Are they going to watch it on Netflix? Are they, are they broadening this out? They seem to have kind of discovered a couple of comedians who hadn't made it big with specials otherwise. Well, I have to say, I watch a lot of comedy on Netflix. It's good counter-programming to watching the news sometimes. Did you watch so it on watch, HBO? I watch a lot of... I, I, you know, I watch some on, on HBO, but I feel like I've discovered more people on Netflix. I think H, uh, Netflix has found they could spend a ton of money and they could lure over big name comedians and they could keep people coming back. This is the kind of thing that's pretty easy to watch in short clips. It might be a long hour long special. People can come watch a couple minutes at a time and they can keep on feeding you more content. So they're really able to take their huge wealth of, of cash and just invest in these big name comedians. And I think the name of the game right now for Netflix is investing to get the volume of content they need, especially when you look at the fact that Disney as well as possibly NBC Universal, <laughs> as well as AT&T, could all pull back their content that they've been licensing as they prepare to launch their own services. So right now, Netflix has to spend big, not just to lock in subscribers and make them feel like they're getting value, but to make sure that they have enough content that when those licensing deals start to go away, yeah. they're not left uh, with thinner library. Right along those lines, the Jeet, a viewer, comments, digital changes distribution of media more than any other aspect. Media moves at the speed of light. So does its flywheel effect. Scott, final word here. You're talking about comedy. Uh, Ali Wong comes to mind. She, she did that kind of hilarious uh, online parody of the UCLA gymnast kind of furthering this whole digital marketing thing uh, that she has going of her comedy career. That was somebody who we really didn't know about before the Netflix special, right? Yes, that was actually someone that I personally, quote unquote, discovered via her Netflix specials. And now I count myself as a fan. I think what Netflix is doing is twofold because they can afford to. A, they're throwing ungodly amounts of money at people that any general moviegoer or entertainment consumer has heard of. You know, a Chris Rock, a, a you know, up until recently, Louis C.K., you know, and people like that. They're, hey, look, look who we can get. And they're also doing what they can to push lesser known names to the forefront so the other narrative is look who we can discover yeah come to netflix and see this person before they're cool yeah and i think netflix's overall goal as it has to be is to spend possibly overspend at this point with the hopes is that when there's you know a dozen different you know streaming options and consumers aren't necessarily going to want to spend 100, 150 bucks a month on each individual streaming package. That Netflix becomes one of the ones that everybody gets, yeah. along with you know one or two others. Yeah. That it's... Netflix becomes the one that you have to subscribe to, even if you don't subscribe to, you know, Disney Plus, Hulu, D uh, excuse me, Disney Plus, Hulu. Uh, DC Universe, the universal <laughs> one that's coming, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, so many. Um, you know, Viacom just uh, announced the Pluto TV uh, acquisition earlier today. Sounds like, from what I'm gathering from every award season, matters with the Hollywood establishment, getting people to work with these streaming services. Social media uh, matters to retain the audience, attract the audience of payers, and then, hey, actors. Big name actors still matter in streaming services, perhaps more than they do at the box office, which to me kind of explains why so many of them love this over the top era as well. Thank you, Julia Borston, Scott Mendelson. Um, this has been Fort Knox. Rich ideas, powerful people talking about the streaming area, content. What really makes things valuable? How much is a Roma worth, which is how much is a you worth? Something we're going to continue to talk about as these battles between Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Hulu, Disney, NBC Universal on down the line continue. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.